Let's say for hello. Yeah, now you can speak. Good. Well, I'm so sorry I'm late. I was actually I was in the wrong Zoom room. <laughs> And I was thinking, how sad, no one is coming tonight. <laughs> and then I realized I must be in the wrong place. Hello. There we go. You guys. Debbie's here. Oh. We're here. <laughs> it's nice to see everyone. Nice that to was... be seen. Right back. How was your New Year's, Debbie? It was nice. I know we didn't. We missed your class on New Year's. I'm That's sorry. Okay, don't <laughs> sorry. There was actually like a sort of a different group than normal. We had some of our our uh, our regulars, Jerry and Tamar, were there, but some other okay. people also. Some returns. Um, everyone deserves a night off. <laughs> we had we had our kids here, and we were hanging nice. out. There, so. Oh, that's great. Where do they, they live in other places? Most of them? Um, no, most of them live in Chicago. And then I have one, I have a son in Madison. He's not far away. Oh. So he drove in, we tested them for COVID and we left them in the house. Oh, that's so nice. And half of my group has already gotten the vaccine. Oh, Dan got his second vaccine shot today. So. Mazel tov. Very exciting. Thank you. Very exciting. Or Yashar Koch, I don't know what, what one said. <laughs> All I had to do was roll up my sleeve. It wasn't that. De Debbie, are they, are they distributing vaccine now already? Well, I mean, to the me the medical professionals are getting Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> my so husband actually just got the email that he, they're, they're ready to start phase 1B in um, Philadelphia. And so schools are going to begin to get them soon. So he's like, pre-registered for whenever that happens but oh that's good yeah here here and in milwaukee and every we're still in 1a yeah we're not we're not past that yet uh, yeah i was surprised to hear it seems like every county here is a little bit different um which is terrible but not surprising <laughs> right right um yeah well we have a decentralized health system, so that's how it's going to work. Yeah. Do you think it'll get better with the new administration? I don't know. I mean, again, the way our system is set up to give vaccines is people going to their own doctor's offices, right? Versus, say, someplace like Israel, where it's set up that everyone walks into a clinic. Um, so they already have the infrastructure to do things in a centralized manner. Mm. Here, we don't have that. The other thing that's making the vaccine distribution go very slowly here is the next group are people who are living in nursing homes. Yeah. And it takes a long time to do those vaccines. You know, individual people going to individual rooms, talking to them five or 10 minutes or more about what the vaccine is and then having to give it them making sure they don't have a reaction. So it's slow. Yeah. Interesting. So here the vaccine is being given at some nursing homes in like the party room, sort of like it seems like at the hospital where they're doing batches or, and um, one of the, one of the people I know is um, there's like a CVS in their sort of compound. So there's like a old age home and also assisted living and uh, it's like a senior village or something. And there everyone, ha everyone who was able was supposed to go to CVS first. Right, so CVS and Walgreens are contracted to distribute the vaccine, so mm. that's why. But I mean, a lot of people who are getting the vaccine can't get out of their room. That's right. That's why you have to go do it. And um, I think there's a lot of chatter about maybe this isn't the best way to do it, and maybe the way to do it is really just get as many vaccines and as many arms as quickly as we can. Mm. Um, because, you know, the vaccine rollout in some ways is slow, but we're doing now like 400,000 vaccines a day, which is more than any other country by, you know, a factor of two or three. We just have a lot of people. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot going on in the world right now. <laughs> you think? Yeah, the world. <laughs> 
America, uh, DC. And I actually, I feel like in a sort of weird position here because I feel like I know you guys so well, but I'm not a part of your you know, broader community. And so I thought a lot about how and what to teach tonight. I teach a partial class at my shul locally on Wednesday nights and I taught something different with them. I, I think, think if it's okay with you guys, I'm gonna say like, we're gonna leave the politics to the side. It feels like a dangerous territory for me to wade into. Um, but of course, I think things like will bubble up. It's hard to divorce regular life from Torah learning life. Um, and I also think that there are a lot of interesting parallels in what's happening in the Torah reading with what's happening in the nation. You know, nation building or reformation or redefinition is is just an uh, I think an overlap with what what the parsha is going through, and so. I think it's impossible to avoid, but I guess I would just say I respect everyone's opinion. I obviously don't really know anyone's political meanings. I think, you know, there's like a lot of scariness, but, um, you know, we'll see how it goes, I guess. <laughs> That's my disclaimer. Don't be worried. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so I wanted to look at Moshe a little bit today. Um, kind of exciting. We finished all of Breesheet together um, and we are turning to the beginning of Parshat Shemot. Um, we're starting to leave the individual behind and move into the, the building of the nation. Um, so we'll stop looking every week at one person, but I couldn't help but look at Moshe this week since he's such an important person in the building of a nation. Um, and we really follow him throughout, from Shemot throughout the rest of the Torah. Um, and so I wanted to look at why Moshe, like how, what, what makes him worthy of such a great job of leadership, right? He seems like sort of the most unlikely of choices in so many ways, uh, reluctant to start, you know, uncomfortable, unhappy with his, his flock. Um, but yet there's something about him that really, that obviously starts this process uh, moving. So, so I wanna look first at like why, one option and then move uh, back to the burning bush. And I say back because uh, for those of uh, us who are all here together for the first, the first class uh, for Brishi, we looked at the Bira Hadoleket, the burning building that Avraham saw. And we mentioned very briefly Moshe and the burning bush there and so I thought it would be interesting to circle around back to the 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 burning, um, and that was also that was a hard week in this country. So I guess themes and cycles will repeat throughout the next few months uh, as things begin to change. So let's let me share my screen for anyone who didn't um, get the source sheet. I think that it did go out in the email today. Oops, this is not the right place. I really understand why that is. Hold on one second. Okay. Too many windows up at any one time here. Okay, there we go. Um, so, right, the, the parasha opens at, uh, in a transitionary parak. Um, and then when we move into parak bet, we see um, the place where Moshe is born. Right, so the pasuk says, V'tahar ha'isha v'teled ben v'tere oto ki tov hu. Right, so this is at a time where Paro is um, instructing the midwives to throw Jewish babies into the Nile. Um, but yet here we see a woman and, you know, we assign her a name later, but at the moment she is nameless and she has a son who she sees is beautiful, um, is how it's uh, translated in the in the English, but just that he was good, right? And she hid him for three months. And so this story, lots of people have spoken about and taught um, you know, beautifully about what it means to be sort of anonymous at the beginning of leadership, that, that there, none of the names of the characters are assigned at this moment. Um, but Sota, the, the um, Gemara in Masachat Sota starts to fill in some of the backstory for us. Um, and they, the Gemara notes, right, that the, the Pasuk, um, says that she saw that he was a good child, that she was tov, right? This is the, the bold here. Um, and it was taught in a Breita that Rabbi Meir says, tov is Moshe's real name, right? And, and Shmot is an interesting um, parsha because uh, there are like, a lot of 
playfulness with names, Shifra and Pua's names, what they mean. Um, and interestingly, the rabbis assign a lot of names to Moshe. Um, right here, they assign uh, his birth name as Tov or Tuvia. Um, you know, later they talk about um, names that Hashem gives him. But interestingly, and, and I think noteworthy, the name that Moshe carries is the one that the, um, the Bat Paro, the Egyptian princess, gives to him um, throughout his life, um, which I think maybe says something about foster parenting or, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly what about Bat Paro, you know, the merit that she saved his life. Um, but here, here um, he, is, he is known as Tuvia, um, because he was good. And Rabbi Nechanya says um, that he was good because they saw he was fit for prophecy, right? Or he was born when he was already circumcised. That is sort of uninteresting to me. But there's something about um, being born, like Moshe was born fit for leadership, right? Before he was even out of the womb, like right when he comes out, um, nothing about him or his upbringing there, but there's something about like his internal self. Um, and the rabbis note that um, they, they observe that at the time he was born, um, right? The Sha'ash and Oled Moshe and Olad Moshe need Malay Habai Kulo Or, that the, the house was filled with light, which is, you know, I don't know if this is controversial to say, but it's kind of how I picture the nativity scene. I think often there's that light over the manger, right? Okay, at least Nelson <laughs> knows what I'm talking about. Thank you. I like that empathetic nod. <laughs> um, but I do, I, right? I think there's something about sort of that like blessedness that we associate with Christianity today, but the rabbis certainly saw that um, as with Moshe. And what they're doing is they're playing a little bit on the pasuk at the very beginning of Breshit, where it says, Vayar Elohim or Kitov, right? That God saw the light and it was good. There's something about Moshe that has like a, an echo of creation to it. And whether that's creation of Moshe as a leader or the very, very beginning glimmer uh, of creation of a nation um, that happens with Moshe. And I think this is a beautiful Gemara. It's very inspired. Um, but at the same time, none of us had a, you know, I don't think anyone's hospital room <laughs> filled with light when we were born. Um, Moshe goes on to live. That's the, the sort of nature aspect, right? Nurture would be Moshe goes on to live in the castle, the palace. Can I just say one thing to maybe make you feel better about the circumcision? Please. All right. So that's part of, that means he's... <clears throat> created perfectly okay. fully circumcised um so it does go along with that theme hmm. okay i like that that's very nice <laughs> i think when you think about later in the the parak um when sipara does the own her own you know her own children's milot mm -hmm. and there's like that piece about the, the you snake know, yeah, I don't know. There's something about it, but I like I like that, right? If that's how we're sort of intended to be, he came out exactly as intended and perfect, and that's that is nice. Thank you for sharing. I saw my first bris up close last week, and I will never be the same. <laughs> um, at least it wasn't my own child. Um, so I, I do think there's something beautiful about this, but knowing that we are not, we can't be Moshe, we, our room was not filled with light um, and we can't grow up in the, the castle or the palace watching a, a ruler lead. And so like, where does that leave us? If it's nature or nurture and we can't really achieve either of those, um, what can we learn or what can we draw from Moshe that um, is more relatable maybe is what I would say. Um, and so I think that uh, a, th a piece that is key to where um, Moshe is actually um, encounters God, which is similar to the Abraham story in that Midrash, right, is that uh, Moshe first encounters God in the burning bush, right? We see, I would say, like glimpses of a future leader before then when we see um, the Egyptian and the, the Jew, the Jewish person and the Jewish person fighting and then the Jewish person and Egyptian fighting and Moshe steps in, right? I think we see a little bit of it when um, Moshe gets to the well with um, his future wife being there, but we don't see him encounter God until the, the burning bush. So let's look at those psukim for, for a minute here. Um, 
right? So it says, Umosha hayavroet so nitro chotno kohen midian, right? Moshe is, um, has, has left his life in Egypt and in the, the palace, and he is now a, a shepherd for his, his father-in-law. Um, and he comes, he comes to this place called Chorev, the mountain of God, which he doesn't know, presumably. Uh, right, and an angel of God appears to him a uh, secondary representative, right, um, appears in the, the form of this bush on fire, uh, not burning. And there's no, um, there's like no announcement, right? No revelation of God, no dialogue. Um, and it's not until um, the next Pasuk where Moshe says, V'yomer Moshe asura na, right? Um, how is it translated here? I must turn aside. Um, like he has to physically maybe turn his body. Right? I have to look at this amazing site. Why doesn't the bush burn? And it's only then once Moshe has done this sort of physical act of turning to the bush, right? Vayar Hashem kisar lirot. And again, there is a a much more shot level echoing of the Abraham story here, right? The double call of Moshe, Moshe, like Abraham, Abraham, and then the response of Hineni. Um, so Moshe is wandering by. I think that the text by telling us that it wasn't until Hashem saw that he had turned to look um, is telling us that had Moshe seen the bush, which apparently in the desert in the summer is not unusual for there to be some brush fire here and there, right? Had he not turned to look, had he just sort of said, oh, a, a brush fire and walked on by, that maybe he would have, you know, gone on to be a shepherd and someone else would have come, hopefully, to save Bnei Israel or, or not, or we wouldn't be here, but, but that he would not have had this encounter. It was not it was not a simple, straightforward meeting. There was like almost like a, a hidden test built in. So um, I think there are there are some like uh, interesting ways to think about sort of what that test was, and I brought three different um, perspectives. The first is that Professor Nachum Sarna um, notes that he says, right, to see that a bush is on fire is easy. To see that it is not consumed takes time and patience, right? So Moshe was, and I think that that is the, the um, aspect of the burning bush that we spoke about when we talked about the Biraha Doleket, right? That Moshe um, didn't just go on by, he waited and he sort of looked into it. He wanted to see what was happening. Um, and Arya Bernstein, who is a, a teacher in many different contexts, I uh, learned from him at Drisha in New York. Um, he talks about the fugitive Moshe who's tending his sheep, which is not the way that I often think about him, but is in fact, I think in some ways what he was. Um, and an unusual thing catches his eye he gazed and there was the right, the, there was a bush all aflame, yet the bush was not consumed. And he's just quoting the psukim here, right? And I must, Moshe said, I must turn aside to look at this marvelous sight. Why doesn't the bush burn up? And although the reader knows that this is a sign from God, right? We were told that the malach is there in the bush in the first pasuk. Moshe does not, right? We don't know if he sees an angel. Arya Bernstein is assuming he doesn't. He just thinks it's interesting. Right? And I think that that's like a big piece for an, uh, a leader to just be interested. And we saw that with Avraham in the, the Biraha Doleket too, right? To be engaged in the world around us. We see yeah, a new well, world thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah well, go ahead. I was just thinking that this is the second time that Moshe sees something and doesn't mm -hmm. turn aside. And the first one was when he saw the Jew being uh, beaten by the Egyptian taskmaster. Mm -hmm. He didn't turn aside. So in both cases, it changed the course of his life hmm. and of our lives. Yeah. I like that. I like that there's also, it's almost like a bookend to his um, fugitive nature, right? He, he's not a fugitive and then he takes action in that first case and he becomes a fugitive. And this is the beginning of his return. Um, I like that a lot. That's very nice. When I was learning in preparation for this class, I saw an interesting, um, 
note from, I think it was Rabbi Alex Israel, who's a, a teacher in Israel. He used to teach at girls seminaries when I was a girl in seminary. Um, and he noticed that uh, the word vayar, to see, is one that really um, applies to Moshe. Moshe sees a lot of things. He, he, you know, he's, he notices things. And that it's that ability to turn and to empathize that is what makes him a leader. I like, that's very nice. Thank you, Tamar. Um, so, right, so here Moshe, again, he can't turn away, right? He, he sort of finds himself drawn into the situation, which I think is similar to the Egyptian and the Jew uh, fighting. Um, and and Arya Bernstein notes, right, we see unusual things all the time, but how often do we actually pay attention to them? More often we ignore them, explain them away, or feel too busy tending our sheep to investigate. Had Moshe not been driven by a need to understand, he never would have had the chance to hear God's voice. Note the language. When Hashem saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him. It is Moshe's expression of intellectual curiosity that justifies calling him and giving him the job. Strategizing within the well-defined parameters of the task at hand does not cut it. One must be constantly studying the entire world. After all, the source for solving the greatest national problems might lie in an unusual and small bush. Um, and he, he wrote this a while ago, uh, Arya Bernstein. Um, and I, you know, I think there's a lot to be said. There's a lot of commentary on the sne, right? Sort of like Har Sinai, we say is the smallest, most humble mountain. The sne is like the smallest, most humble uh, vegetation in the desert. Um, and yet that is where God decides to, to call out from. And it does not deter Moshe from looking, even though it might be sort of the most unusual in the most usual um, in the desert. So I think that both but I, I personally like both of those, I guess, obviously, I brought them for, for us to, to look at. Um, I'm happy to hear if people have ideas, but I think that this sort of like a, a patience and also a, a curiosity are, are wonderful leadership characteristics um, that Moshe displays. But then I think there is um, another, another piece, and that's about this, that really focuses it on this physical um, turning piece. Um, and that is, um, they explore in um, Shemot Rabbah, they explore two different uh, ways to think about Moshe's turning. Um, so Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish says, um, and he turned his face and looked, um, as it says, the Lord saw that he had turned to look. And when God saw that Moshe looked at him, he said, this is the one who's fit to lead Israel, right? Um, and so I think that what it is, is that it's that searching thing, right? It's a little bit like the Arya Bernstein model that um, it's, or I would call it the Tamar model, right? That he can't help but turn to look at something interesting or troubling in the world. And he's not afraid to, to look into it, to look into that fire. But there's this other, um, almost presented as like a machloket here, other uh, opinion of Rabbi Yitzchak. And Rabbi Yitzchak said, what does it mean that he turned to look? God saw that he turned and was outraged when he saw the suffering of the Israelites in Egypt. Therefore, he was fit to be his leader, their leader. And that is when God called to him from the bush. And so here, I think that um, Rabbi Yitzchak is, is looking, he's saying that like uh, Moshe turned to look back, right? He turned to look from his own life in the moment as a, a happy go lucky shepherd to look back to his people in Israel and to or in Egypt, I'm sorry, B'nai Israel in Egypt, and to remember their suffering, right? That it's easy, Moshe found it was easy to physically run away. And the burning bush is a moment where he turns um, back to the people that he's left behind. That and and there's this like piece of this pain that he can't bear to experience, right? The, he feels, it's like Moshe feels so much of his um, fellow man's pain. And that is certainly what we see in that interaction that causes him to run to the desert. Um, and that is what we would say is, I would say is like the quality of empathy. Um, and that Moshe, so he is curious, he is uh, patient, but he is empathetic. And he was a person brought up in the palace. It's hard to imagine that he really could have empathized with the, the Jewish person who was being um, beaten by the Egyptian. You'd think, he, if anything, he would identify more with the Egyptian, but he was able to, to see and to empathize with the, the Jewish man at that moment. 
And then even once he had left them behind and he had sort of tried to remove himself from the suffering of B'nai Israel, it's, it says that he had to sorely wrote, he had to turn back and say like, oh, I, I do have to get back to that. <laughs> I can't leave it alone forever. Um, and that the leadership comes on that, that turning. And it's such like a small mo a movement right? Um, that uh, like, it's not a grandiose, you know, Moshe is not a grandiose kind of leader. And it's just in that little shifting of his body that causes him to be the one um, to be fit for redemption. And there's something like a little bit fragile in that, right? If only Moshe hadn't looked over his shoulder and like rubber necked the, the burning bush, then would he have actually been the leader? But also I think something comforting because we can't all be born in a, a, a bath of light <laughs> in our rooms with Hashem smiling on us. None of us are born with our, our bodies complete uh, the way we are supposed to be. Um, but we can make those little turns in our life, however we find them. Um, and that when we see the something unusual, when we make that turn, when we allow our body to turn to that, if we have the patience to really look into it, even when it might be overwhelming or hot, um, you know, we we can find ourselves in a position of power and leadership that we we will better ourselves and the community around us. Yeah, Jerry, please. All these commentaries suggest that the rabbis were wondering themselves what made Moshe special. They didn't see anything. They're looking for clues here and there. The text doesn't seem to convince them by itself that he's obviously the leader of the nation. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, on the shot level, there's so much about Moshe that seems like he's not a good leader, right? Even Moshe is the first to acknowledge in this encounter um, but there are so many midrashim. I think that's a great point, right? There, there's that midrash um, I learned in grade school, like where Moshe is placed in front of the burning coal and the gold, right? Like Paro seemed to see something about wanting to be a leader in him. And he wanted to make sure his gold was safe, right? His legacy was safe. Um, and then there are so many midrashim about why he, he uh, you know, is Aral Svatayim, why he's not able to speak. Um, he, you know, Moshe is so ready to give up so many times telling God to just kill him and start again and take all the people, right? I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't, um, I understand why the Midrash feels this need because he doesn't come off as such a inspired leader, maybe is what we would say. Um, well, if you read the Pshat, I yeah. think it's a little bit of an indictment in a way of Moshe and why they have to spin these stories because it says, an angel of God appeared to him in this bush. And what did Moshe say? He said, oh, that's cool. That bush is not burning. That's what he saw. He didn't see the angel of God. Mm -hmm. And then God had to actually, you know, speak like Moshe, Moshe, this is God in here. That's what you're supposed to be looking at. Not this oddity of a burning bush. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you see Moshe as being like a little obtuse, not patient. <laughs> For sure. It's, I mean, it, it seems clear. It says the Malach, you know, appeared to him um, and Moshe saw the burning bush. He didn't see a Malach and he didn't know that God was in there until God saw, oh, he's looking this way. Hello. Hello. I'm here. And it had to be God himself, not even a Malach because a Malach wasn't it had to be so obvious for him to see. And, and I think that, like Jerry said, that's what the Mepharshim are reacting to. It's like, well, it can't be that Moshe is this dense that he doesn't see what's going on. So this is really what happened. He really was looking, you know, ahead and back and, and all these, uh, these different things. Hmm. Well, here's a crazy question, maybe like a little too crunchy, you let me know. But I wonder like how often do we contextualize when like when actually we might have been touched by God as well, right? How many times do we say, well, I swerved right at the right moment or I, you know, I don't know what the thing is, but I think often we we miss the opportunity to see God. We are, we're able to say, oh, a burning bush and sort of walk on by like, I, maybe I guess I'm saying I don't fault Moshe. I think it's human nature to see the regular and not the, the divine. 
Okay, maybe maybe I overstated it, but yeah, no, I agree with you. Well, it I wasn't you dense, didn't, I think but you didn't, he didn't see it. it. I guess I just think that's like the human experience. It's not really Moshe's fault, maybe on some level. Right, right, especially when you're like working and you're, you know, sheep are a pain in the neck. They're running all over and they smell bad and... Um, isn't it more that he's the reluctant leader, right? He just, he doesn't want to lead this people out. Yeah. He doesn't want that job. Yeah. Yeah. I, Go ahead, Nelson. I, I, I saw, I think that Yael brought out uh, a line that I've been developing um, of some analogies since the beginning. There is the, the issue of uh, Moses, see the, 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 the small guy, the, the Hebrew, the, the Jew, not the powerful oppressor, but they mm -hmm. oppressed the poor. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the phenomenon of the burning bush is in a, like you said, is in a bush. It's not a big forest. It's the smallness of the bush that in, in the little things, that's where God appears. Mm -hmm. uh, like the, the uh, Mount Sinai is not a huge mountain. It's a small heart, small mountain. And is about to form a, a, a nation, uh, a smallest nation. It's not an empire like the Egyptian or the Babylonian Empire. Mm -hmm. It's a small nation that's going to become delight into the nations. Mm -hmm. So, from the particular to the general, from the small to the large, mm -hmm. um, Moses was also small. He didn't even see himself as great. Mm -hmm. And then he was okay. You are going to be great, whether you like it or not. So mm -hmm. I thought there was a whole line here that. Uh, you inspired me to come up with. Hmm, I like that. And I, you know, I was thinking also Moshe is, we know he's not an orphan, right? But he sort of presents as an orphan perhaps to himself, right? If, if we assume he doesn't know that his family is sort of watching from the sidelines. And I think that feeds into that same um, way of thinking about oneself as small or sort of insignificant, left behind. Um, and I think the leader of small things, right, is reluctant to be the leader of big things. I think that's 100% correct, uh, very astute. And that's the story of the Haggadah, going from a low place to a high place. Hmm. Nice. It's also preceded by another shepherd who's rather obtuse, Yaakov, and hmm. much the same attitudes to what they see around them, hmm. and much to the very much consumed with their concern for the sheep as opposed to what they see around them. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think maybe it was last week in Dafyomi they talk about the um, the matzah as is it, you know, is it a bread of affliction or a bread of joy and celebration, which kind of reminds me of what you were saying, right? That um, from the low to the high. It starts as the bread of affliction. It ends as this bread of joy and celebration of freedom. Um, I think, yes, those themes around our nation building are really strong. Um, and we never really give up that small but mighty persona, right? As, as you were hinting, Nelson. Interesting. So I, that's fascinating. I feel like uh, this was received very differently than I intended, but in a really nice way. <laughs> So you're not super impressed with Moshe, which is good, right? He is accessible. Um, and maybe that's, you know, to me, that makes him even more relatable that I didn't think about it that way, but that God has to literally get up out of the bush and yell Moshe, Moshe for him to like realize he was having this really special divine encounter. And I think people do have those moments and experiences. And so often we write them off as good luck or bad karma or whatever, you know, the thing is that that happens to us. And maybe we should turn ourselves to that site too. Maybe then we would feel more of that, you know, it's unlikely. And if you do hear your name being called, maybe go, you know, talk to someone. <laughs> but, um, but we could see more of the divine than we do normally. I imagine, I'm guessing that the Mafarshim probably have a lot to say about his reply, he named me. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, yes, certainly an echo of Abraham, which is like a, a good thing, right? He's, you know, at least at the very, very beginning, he's ready. Even if he's quick to say, well, actually, not really, he named me. <laughs> his, his inclination is to say, you know, you're calling me, here I am, I'm ready. 
which is good. You know, that's like a good baseline. That's the to be willing to turn, to be willing to empathize, to be willing to say he need me. Even if all of the fears and anxieties consume him in the end, he has something, you know, God has something to work with. <laughs> he has the he need to build upon. Maybe the better takeaway is that leaders and leadership is hard and complicated and we should have more empathy for the leader, uh, you know, because it's a hard job and we don't always see the help that we're given. There's also a, a warning against being arrogant. You don't have to be an arrogant, uh, grandiose, um, narcissistic leader. You have to be humble and small so that you can really be the chosen leader. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, and that's why he's played against Paro, right? As Paro is this <clears throat> is this very strong leader and you know that he's just making these edicts and and then you have little Moshe. Yeah. 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 And I hope that in a few weeks we'll look at, at Paro and um, the way that he sort of creates bad patterns for himself. Right. And so to think about Moshe as having created these good patterns, he had conditions himself to turn when he saw something troubling. And so that allowed him maybe to find the bush, right? In contrast to Haro, who conditions himself not to see the good, um, by conditioning that in himself, he was able to then see this little bush and, and find something great in it. Okay. It's like, Eli like Elijah was, when he says, I'm not in the wind. I'm not in the fire. I'm the small voice. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what God is in the small man. Yeah, that's one of my favorite passages. I love that. Wonderful. Wow, this was a great conversation. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Um, I'm going to stop the share so I can see everyone's face before we say goodbye. Um, this is wonderful. Thank you. I wish everyone a weekend of uh, shalom, <laughs> comfort, <laughs> and, and uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. All right. If, if Moses, it just occurred to me that if Moses ever lost an election, he would be the first one to concede. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be happy to give it away. <laughs> Thank you, Nelson. Thank just you. On a, a light note and a laugh. That's nice. Thank you. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Yeah. Nice to see you, Nelson.